Let's please rise up. Commit your heart into the hands of the Lord and ask God to minister to you at a time like this. <coughs> In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we bless you for the comfort of the scriptures. Thank you for the provision and assurance in your word that you are coming for your own, especially in perilous times like this. So evacuate us and get there to be with you hereafter forevermore. Lord, we are looking unto you. That moment when it comes, the gracious moment of deliverance and rapturing the saints, Lord, let's settle the question where we will be. As we go through what we are going today, help us to be in the right place in Jesus' name. Open your word to us and help us to abide by it. In Jesus' name we pray. As you sit down, please turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I will read verses 13 all through to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 all through to 18. Our topic this morning is steadfastness of rapture ready saints. Steadfastness of rapture ready saints. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I will read verses 13 down to 18. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul's revelation about the rapture is intended to remove every cloud of confusion on the topic. Hence, he started in verse 3, 13 by saying, I will not have you to be ignorant. There was a lot of ignorance up to that moment in time. Prior to that time, actually in fairness to the New Testament church, there had never been a detailed revelation of the issues about rapture in the sense of which Paul received the revelation he had. And that was why ignorance prevailed all through. And Paul was writing to tell them, I will not have you ignorant. Even though we had isolated examples of uh, rapture occurring in the Bible prior to this, yet it remained a mystery to a lot of people up to that point in time. You see, get to that. What is rapture? Rapture in the literal sense of the word means being caught up, sucked up, sunshined up, catching up, rapture. And it refers to that great event, glorious event, when the dead in Christ, when we talk about dead in Christ, those that believed in Jesus believed up till the time they died. That's what he's talking about, the dead in Christ. They will rise first, an angel will sing, a trumpet a will shout, or blow a trumpet, those that believed in Jesus up to the time they died, they will hear that trumpet. And we which are alive, the living saints, both of us will now ascend to heaven to meet Jesus who will be there up there in the cloud and we will be with him forever and ever and ever. And brethren, 
It's an exclusive clause, uh, club of people that will respond to this trumpet sound. And that's why the scriptural reference we read this time, and the one I'm going to refer to you also, makes it clear. It is not all commerce affair. When rapture takes place, it's not the people, whole people of the world that will go, not people, all the people that ever died that will make it. It's for a select few. Look again at uh, verses 13 to 18. You will see the way he shows is for selected number of people by the use of the word we or brethren. In verse 13, I will not have you to be ignorant brethren. It's not the whole world he's talking about. Look at verse 14. If we believe that Jesus, that even so them also which slept in Jesus, not those that did not sleep in him. Verse 15, I say unto you by the word of the Lord that we, it's a club of we, not the world. In verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, not dead in sin and licentious lifestyle. Verse 17, then we which are alive, in verse 18, comfort one another with these things. Talking to the club of those that belong to that exclusive individuals that will partake in the rapture. First Corinthians chapter 15. In the book of First Corinthians chapter 15, reading verses 51 to 53. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 53 it says from verse 51 look at it i'm still talk, telling you even if it's talking about rapture it doesn't mean it's applicable to everybody there's still exclusivity about it from verse 51 behold i show you a mystery we see we believers shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump that's the trumpet of god for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality yes he's talking about we the believers we are going to be changed when the trumpet of god sounds and Yes, to us, not to the whole world. In actual fact, when you talk about eschatological events, order of events about the second coming of Christ, you see that his second coming is in two phases. Rapture is phase one, then the literal appearance of Christ is in phase two. So we are talking about this rapture which is the first phase of the two-phase process of the second coming of the Lord. At this rapture, sure, God will interrupt human affairs. He will come in into the law of gravity and put it to a stop and then take up all believers. It's not normal, natural faith from human beings to float in the air. But this time around, for believers that are qualified, God will come and defy the law of gravity when the trumpet of God sounds, sense that are alive in Christ, even those that died and have been buried, all of them will come up and then rise up to meet with the Lord in the air in a twinkling of an eye. You might ask me, do you believe that? Yes. Why? Even though I don't have a literal proof, the Bible said so. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, let's see what he said from his own lips. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, Gospel according to John, chapter 14, I'm going to read verses 1 to 3. John, chapter 14, from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now pay attention to verse 3. That's the bullet point. If I go and prepare a place for you, what will happen? I'll come again and receive you 
unto myself. You see, come again and receive you to myself means the rapture. I finish it up, I'll come, receive you. That's the point he will rapture the saints to himself. That where I am, there you may be also. He's in heaven. We'll be with him in heaven, debunking those that say, well, we are going to inherit the earth and so on. Wherever Jesus is and we acknowledge he's in heaven, that's where we are going to be eventually. And brethren, to participate in this glorious event, which we are exposing this morning, you need to be very careful with your Christian life. You need to walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. To partake in it, three essential things are required. One, prayerfulness. Every day, as you see the signs all over, as you see the have challenges coming up and as you see the glorious package in the in the promises of those that make the rapture your prayer you'll be prayerful every day telling god i don't want to miss this rapture number two it requires watchfulness people that want to make you double into momentary sin compromise and so on what do you do the lost coming is so near so clear rapture could take place anytime you will watch and then be able to escape the damnation. What again do you require? Holy lifestyle, holiness lifestyle. Because when the trumpet sounds, it has a magnet attached to it. It will only magnet those that are living righteous lives. Unbelievers, sinners, they will carry on like they were doing. None of them will even realize the rapture has taken place. But any person that is living holy lifestyle, will be magnet, will be raptured, will be sucked up by that uh, trumpet of God that will sound. Philippians chapter 3. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 20 and 21. Book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, you see the preparation required. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our manner of life, our conversation, our lifestyle, our expectation is in heaven. Look at verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, and it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's it. We are looking to that. And this is what he is going to do in our own life. Titus chapter 2. In the book of Titus chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Titus chapter 2. Reading verses 12 and 13. It says, verses 12 and 13, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing, appearing of the great God and our Lord jesus christ expectation of every believer at every point in time is to sit up and be looking forward going through these three things prayerfulness watchfulness and holy lifestyle brethren rapture could take place any moment don't have any signs and the point is your readiness and watchfulness will be characterized by that which follows some of our people in the society working probably let's take example a medical practitioner that is on call duty a nurse practitioner when they say you're on call it's like a fixed a fluid schedule they won't say you are you are working from 3 p.m to 6 p.m no you're on call for maybe 12 hours what does it mean you could carry on your little other engagements any moment there's an emergency, we're going to buzz you. There's a hotline we're going to call you upon. And you see, many of them don't really get into engaging things within that period that they are on call. Though it might end up at the end of the day, they will just receive one call, 
Sometimes it will be more. But there's no pre precision as to when. So they carry their lifestyle without hot contact for telephone. Waiting. Any moment they are called, they will forget all they are doing, jump into their car or respond to the call or react in accordance with the dictates of the emergency call that they have. You could spread it to firefighters. They will relax in their destiny, nothing. But suddenly, emergency call comes. You see them, the same people joking. They put on their garments and they start rushing to the highway. Sometimes a nation, especially in Israel, they have reserved soldiers. When war, they are there like civilians mixing up, but when war comes immediately, they will blow and contact them. They will drop everything. They will jump into the battlefield. That's the same thing. It's a picture of what the rapture is. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. Let your signal, let your spiritual eye, ears be tuned to heaven where you are waiting for the trumpet's call. It could be that moment you are sleeping. It could be that place you are quarreling with somebody. It could be at the time you are living in licentious lifestyle. Let me just take a moment of sin. It could be, yeah, you might not have time to polish up and get out. And that's what the choir song today, the challenge is so enormous for every one of us. Remember, they came up here before the message and they sang a significant song. Where shall I be when the trumpet shall sound? Where shall I be? If you know I sing it, it doesn't matter. Yes. When it sounds so loud as to wake up the dead, wake up the dead. Where shall you be when it sounds? That's the question we have to settle as we get into the message today. It's like a joke and so on. But brethren, it's a reality. One day, very soon, and I have every expectation, even in our own generation, it could happen. And once it happens, the scripture is asking, where will you be? You run after this mundane thing and this and the other one, and the saints are gone. And there's no second chance anymore. You will not miss the rapture in Jesus' name. Three points. Number one, the reality of rapture. Point number one, the reality of rapture. Point number two, the reasons for the rapture. The reasons for the rapture. Finally, we look at readiness for the rapture. Readiness for the rapture. Point number one, the reality of rapture. You see, scripture contains a lot of revelation about the rapture of the saints. And the Lord specifically made us know that it's an event that must take place and it will be sudden. Nobody will anticipate it. It will be very sudden. Look at Matthew chapter 24. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 24. I am going to read verses 40 down to 44. Matthew chapter 24 from verse 40 down to 44. It says, Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. The two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief will come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. You see, the Lord is giving illustration about this. Two shall be in the field, one taking two in the bed, the husband and wife, two women shall be grinding at the mill, and so on. One taking and the other left. Brethren, do you know? Soon and very soon, on that day of rapture, the world will carry on as it is, but there will be news in the airwaves all over the world that certain people have disappeared 
and that is inexplicable what happened to them. But they all have gone out, and there shall be a lot of calamities apparently that will happen. Maybe some drivers are raptured, and then the cars they were driving with the passengers who didn't make it get into crash. It's going to be a great commotion that will be there, and then it will happen that millions of people will disappear under strange circumstances as they were reporting. That's what the Lord is making us know at this. It's not just him alone. Even angels of the Lord, they waited in and showed us there is a suddenness about the rapture. It was a dramatic presentation. Look at it in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 from verse 6, 6 down to 11. Acts chapter 1. You see the thing playing out here, and the angels use it to also teach us the lesson about the suddenness of the rapture. Acts chapter 1, from verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father had put in his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, he was speaking, he finished speaking. Nobody knew what was to happen next. When he are speaking those things, why they beheld, they were waiting for more speech from him. What happened? He was taken up, and in a cloud, received him out of their sight. None of those apostles knew this would happen. It came to them suddenly. And look at verse 10. And while they looked up steadfastly, they were wondering what is happening, which drama is playing out. In heaven, as he went up, two men stood by them in white apparel, and said something to them, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from heaven, from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. What like manner? It's unannounced when he departed. And you were looking at him. What's up? What's up? The same manner. You will wake up one day or you are sleeping in the night and you are wondering what schedule you will have tomorrow. Rapture takes place. In the same manner he will come. You see, the key um, argument by those that oppose rapture is that, I mean, it defies rational explanation. What can, can you say that? Um, law of gravity and people will float into the air. They just want to explain things out in the natural sense. And because they've not gotten that natural response, they turn into mocking the doctrine of the coming of the Lord and the rapture itself. As seen in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3. See where the mockers are, are because they say it doesn't I mean it's not rational. What are you talking about? You've been saying this all the while. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Three, from verse 3. Look at where they settled because they couldn't um, decode and uh, explain how the law of gravity is going to be suspended. Second Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, look at specifically what they are saying, in the last days, and we see a lot of them in these days we are living, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of the Lord, the heaven were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. We're just stopping at that verse. But the point is there is mocking and what is it? You've been promising this and saying that. And then how can you defy the law of gravity? It doesn't have any rational explanation. But brethren, let's be simplistic. Let's be connect with each other. There are a lot of things on earth that defy rational explanation. But the same doubters walk around it, obeying it, and knowing that, I mean, even though there is no rational explanation, it is, it is as it is. 
time has come, or time was, when people thought the earth was flat, but now knowledge has evolved, we know it is spherical, round. Now, the same human beings who now believe it's round carry on their affairs without wondering why is it there's no pillar carrying the earth that is suspended in the air. The design aircraft, they fly around the globe not expecting to hit any wall or any pillar that is holding the universe itself. They organize their affairs with that. How is it also you emphasize so much about the law of gravity, but you also believe in outer space? The law of gravity does not work. How do you explain it? Yet you manufacture jets, types of aircraft that could go out of the orbit of Earth where the um, law of gravity operates, and then you have people clothed in a way they can float in the area in the moon and beyond the atmospheric pressure where law of gravity operates because you also work with the assumption that is, is beyond natural explanation why there should be no law of gravity in the outer space as it were. God remains God. And he has an answer for every one of us, especially the doubters. Jeremiah chapter 32. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 32, look at verse 27. Jeremiah chapter 32 in verse 27. Everybody, let's go to that location and see God's own response to those doubters, that he's going to rapture us and that he's going to send us up to heaven. Jeremiah chapter 32, are you there? Please turn your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 32. I am going to read verse 27. Are you there? More of you are coming up. I'm seeing the Bible moving. Jeremiah 32, 27, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for your Lord? No, there is nothing too hard for him. But even at that, brethren, we still have in the Bible scriptural examples of rapture that took place in isolated occasions. Number one, you remember the first person that was ever raptured is called Enoch. And his account is in Genesis chapter 5. But we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5 in verse 5. Hebrews chapter 5 in verse 5. And see the account of Enoch whom God raptured. If he was able to do that for him, and you see a person that really had the rapture without, as it were, dying. Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 5. Verse 5. By faith. Enoch was translated that he would not see death, that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He was living a righteous life, and the scriptures say he was translated. Translation means everything about him trans of taking away entirely. It's not he was transfixed from one location to the other, no. Translated and taken up there in heaven. It's a good example of one that was raptured without testing death. Another example is uh, Elijah the prophet. In fact, Elijah's example is a twofold example. Remember when he was talking with Elisha and his ministry was ending, then suddenly the chariot of fire came and took him. And Elisha, who fulfilled his obligation to see him before he's raptured, said, Oh my Lord, the Lord and chariot of Israel. And then he was taken up in heaven. It's a good example of people that are raptured without testing death. But also a good example that rapture is not the end. When you are raptured, you are out there living somewhere your normal, your life. You, do, you are not extinguished entirely. Because for Elijah, we knew that in the time of Jesus' ministry on earth, he came back with um, Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, discussing with the Lord about his soon disease, about his uh, crucifixion that was coming up, showing that after rapture, he was alive somewhere, he still came back. 
When the rapture takes place for you, it's not the end. Even though we're not seeing you, even though the world does not see you, you've gone to somewhere in the presence of the Lord. And it will be your Lord in Jesus' name. Then the third example is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture tells us he was dead, crucified, dead, buried, dead entirely. Pilate certified that Jesus already died. He was put into the tomb, and after three days, the angel came, there was power, the earthquake came, and so on, and then he resurrected and ascended unto heaven. That's the dead in Christ. Those already died, certified dead. When the rapture takes place, wherever they are in the sea, in the water, burial ground, cemetery, or whatever, God's trumpet, when the trumpet of the angel sounds, they will hear and they will come over. And that's it about this point, the reality of rapture. God is saying, these isolated examples, I'm going to now multiply it in the end times, when we will be raptured. That's the revelation he gave to Paul, which he shared for the church. And my prayer is that you will partake in this glorious experience in Jesus' name. Let's go to point number two, the reasons for the rapture. The reason, why is it that God has set up rapture? As what he wants to use in the end time. I'm going to give you seven reasons from the scriptures why the rapture is inevitable and the promises of rapture within the Bible. Number one, it is a, because of the prayer warnings from the Lord to believers. Prayer warnings of the Lord to the believers. Jesus already said it. And he had warned the believers ahead of time about rapture and what they should do. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Luke chapter 21, from verse 34 to 36. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with drunk, with suffering and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that they come upon you on our ways. Which day? Day of the rapture. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole world. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that to be raptured before the antichrist comes with his evil rule and regime on the world for you to be worthy to escape how do you escape you get into rapture get evacuated with the saints, and to stand before the son of man which he said i will take you to myself so take heed so that you will escape is a prayer warning of the lord himself you see, in the world, even this nation where we are living in, you see, it's a practice that whenever war is building up in any nation, America sends warning to its citizens. And many times they also get involved in literally evacuating them. Places that are unfriendly for them, places they know citizens are going to be you know, exposed to harm. Remember what happened in Afghanistan last year when the, um, the Islamic fundamentalists took over the country and America had to put in aircraft and evacuated the citizens there. See what is playing out presently in Ukraine where Russia is amassing its troops at the border and everything is on, tension is all over. Uh, European nations are also coming together. America already advised their citizens get out and they are assisting them to evacuate because war could take place any time so you see the same thing jesus is saying take heed watch so that you are not overtaken and he's warning us here there's no point it's unscriptural for people that go around the streets and say we are preparing for the antichrist i will stockpile goose uh, i will do this and do that no it's not intention of god or the lord for us to partake on what and bad things that will happen during the great tribulation. That's number one. Number two, preference of God. The preference of God. That's why rapture has to take place. You see, God prefers to get his own to himself prior to releasing his wrath upon the unbelieving world or upon the 
section or segment of the world that live in adamant to his own word. Remember, it was a question that uh, Abraham asked God in Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 to 26. He said, God, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And God said, far be it from me. I am not going to do that. If I see this number of righteous people, I will not. Though he couldn't get to the number, but eventually we notice that the prayer of Abraham and the precept and the plan, preference of God led to Lot and his family being evacuated. It has played out in a lot of other times. Remember Rahab, the hallow. At the time Jericho wall was to fall, preference of God was to evacuate her because she assisted them. She converted and she brought members of her family together. They stayed at a position. Noah and his family, the scriptures say, the whole world was corrupt. Only Noah found favor. Noah was the one that built the ark. So God's preference is that when he wants to unleash terror on the world, his own, he will set them to himself. And that's essentially why our expectation and hope is there. Paul said, comfort one another with these words. Number three, promised presentation of the church to the bridegroom. Promised presentation of the church to the bridegroom, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. That's essentially part of it. Revelation chapter 19. Let's go there. There's a marriage supper that is out there waiting for us. I'm telling you, I want your spiritual eyes to be opened up. It's a great celebration. You never could have done it, seen anything like that. No matter the best of wedding reception you have attended, this one is different. This one, you will sit in tables already made for you. Angels that are ministering to you will be serving you. The Lord himself will come to you know, celebrate with you, wed you, wipe away your tears, thank you, wash your feet, and appreciate you for the great things you've done in holding on to your righteous life till the end. In Revelation chapter 19, look at it from verse 7 down to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife, which is the church, me and you, had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of sins. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. You'll be a blessed partaker in this in Jesus' name. You see, the church is a bride of Christ. Let's still remember, when you are going to wed, you don't, it's unnatural. You set up a wedding day, you fix the date, and you fix the, send the cast, and you allow your bride, your wife, to be out there in dangerous zone, fighting battles, or you allow her to be exposed to dangers that could snuff off the life out of her. Nobody does that. No, you love her. You are waiting for your wedding day. You need to get her out and not allow her to be in that bad position where it's a likelihood of her falling into danger. Number four, preservation of the righteous. You know, we're telling you about the reason. Preservation of the righteous from the antichrists. Preservation of the righteous from the antichrist once the rapture takes place the antichrist will come in his full fury but as far as the church is still here there's no way it's gonna happen there must be a, there will be a removal first of the church first thessalonians chapter 5 in the book of first thessalonians chapter 5 i'm going to read verses 8 down to 9 first thessalonians chapter 5 from verse 8 so 9, it says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God had not appointed us to rot, but what? To obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That rot is talking about the rot of the Antichrist that will come 
upon the world itself. He says, God has not appointed us to go through that rot that the Antichrist is going to unleash on the whole people of the world itself. The church is one that is lettered. When he that lettered is taken out of the way, then that Antichrist man, that evil one, will now come and unleash his terror upon the world. And he says, God has not appointed us to that rot. Number five is a plan of God, plan of God to end the church age. The church age will end. And when the church age ends, then judgment comes. Antichrist takes full control. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at it from verses 6 down to 12. Probably we could get up to that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 6 and now you know that what withhold it that he might be revealed in his time that's what is holding the antichrist from coming that's what he wants to explain for the mystery of iniquity doth already work the signs of the antichrist and the structure for him to reign we're already seeing it only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way and then that's taken out of the way means till the rapture takes place. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivable, deceivableness, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause shall god shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness you see these are descriptions that were not match with believers that will be there no i mean to god will now destroy them send them strong delusion damn them and so on believers must have gone for this to start happening and that's exactly what paul is sharing you know during the great tribulation it's only the jews and believers gentile believers that became born again or those that wake up and then saw that they miss rapture and want to now revive their christian life they will subject matter of the persecution severe persecution by the antichrist not the general believers who must have already been raptured at that point in time so number six now correct number six number one was um prayer warning let's go through this that again number two preference of god the third one promised presentation to the church the fourth one is what preservation of the righteous then the fifth point is what plan of god to end the church age number six now is program of god for israel during the end times program of god for israel during the end time if you look at what's happening now it's like there's a disconnection between the god of the bible and the people of israel they are living themselves they, even though god is fulfilling prophecies to them getting them together and so on but if you go there the original stand is antichrist they just see him as another individual it's not uh, in fact they restrict the preaching of the gospel you make it offense for you to go and proselytize openly we drew a license the other day from one of the christian corporations they gave license for uh, te television broadcast into israel why because they are they now discover their target is to convert the jews and make them know the god of the bible they don't recognize the new testament at all and that's the time of the gentiles which jesus said their time will be fulfilled and then when the rapture takes place the church age ends and god will now go back to israel and connect back with them god and the antichrist will have interest on him and that will be the time the israelites will be ready for their own messiah matthew chapter 23 gospel according to matthew chapter 23 
We're going to read verses 37 to 39. Matthew chapter 23 from verse 37. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 23 from verses 37 to 39. Look at it from verse 37. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoned them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you will not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, which is the situation they are going through presently. A lot of them dying and going to hellfire without knowing Jesus. Going to desolation. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth. Till you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. What will make it happen? The Antichrist will so persecute them. They now realize they miss the Messiah and they will cry unto Jesus, save us, save us. Revival will come upon them. But it will not happen until the church is evacuated. That's the time of the 70th week of Daniel's 70th week prophecy, which Daniel wrote about in Daniel chapter 9. And it's also a peculiar time for Israelites when the Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the Antichrist as God will be in their rebuilt temple and then claim his God and start persecuting them when they now realize that the man they went into covenant with was a fake Messiah. They will call upon the Lord. They will cry when they see him whom they have already Fear. So the program of God for Israel has to come back during the end time, but the church age has to end. Finally, we have preservation of the integrity of the Bible, reason for the rapture, preservation of the integrity of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew's gospel chapter 24, verse 35. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Please turn there. The Lord himself is speaking. And we started by making a reference to himself, wading in on the issue of um, uh, this rapture, that I will come and take you, receive you to myself. Where I am, there you may be also. It's his promise about rapture. That's the promise. He warned us escape the damnation that is coming. Now, when we talk about the preservation of the integrity of the Bible, what do we mean? Look at it in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 35. Are you there? Let's read it together. One, two, go. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Including that of the rapture. If tomorrow somebody comes and says to you, it's not going to happen, it's unbiblical, with all the references we've read today, it's like, remove it from the Bible, then you better don't believe anything about Jesus Christ, about God Almighty. But is it possible? No. It's not going to happen. And that's why we will know that to preserve the integrity of the Bible and the promises of God, there has to be rapture. And you will be a partaker in Jesus' name. Let's finally end with readiness for the rapture. Readiness for the rapture. In Romans chapter 13, the book of Romans chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 11 to 13. Romans chapter 13 from verse 11. Romans chapter 13 from verse 11 to 13. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe knowing the time the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness, nor in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Brethren, these verses are very important and instructive in themselves. They are challenging us to prepare for rapture with consciousness of the fact that of the time we are living in actually. That's what he's saying. Look at the generation we are living in. Look at the things that are playing out. 
prepare for rapture with the consciousness of that. Remember, the Lord in his earthly ministry, during his earthly ministry, told the Pharisees, you can read the signs, you know when the wind gather is going to rain, you read the wind and everything, you can analyze the signs by weather observation, you know how to read that sign about the earth. Or you don't know the signs of the times that the messiah is here with you that the end is already coming upon the world itself the scripture is challenging us let us also know that as we are looking at things what are the principal things you will look at let me tell you something when they ask jesus about the signs of his coming at the end of the age when he talks about his signs of coming he predominantly dwelt with the sign of his second coming, which is literal appearance on earth. The way things will be happening here on earth, by the time he will come the second time, when all eyes will see him and people will be running away from him because he has come to judge the world. During the time he will come and then establish his reign here on earth with saints after the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, all those signs, brethren, we see them taking place. And that second coming of Christ, the literal seven, uh, appearance of him, is going to take place about seven years after the, three, great three, after the rapture of the saints. Once the saints are raptured, Antichrist comes on the scene for seven good years. In the reign of terror, he'll break the reign in the middle of it. And then the seventh year is when Jesus will come for the battle of Armageddon, when the host of Israel and the armies of God will now face the Antichrist in that war. The timeline I'm establishing for you is this. We see literally fulfillment, literal fulfillment of all the signs that will take place before Jesus comes the second time. And it's a seven-year period after the rapture. If they are taking place before us, you see how urgent it is that the rapture could take place any moment from now we need to buckle up what are the things we are seeing as those specific signs the fig tree regathering you see the gathering back of israelites coming back to their line unprecedented a nation that was lost for 2000 years they got back their language they went back to the ground that was a, a desert is fertile now people are saying give up this land they are expanding they are building aliyah that is returning home of jews is happening in a greater dimension nobody is really going to uproot them anymore and they need to come back they are talking about rebuilding their temple and that's the temple the antichrist is going to occupy it's happening before us what are the signs hatred of Jews anti-semitism is on the rise worldwide even America where they used to be so friendly to them New York City you see the objects of attack now why is it happening just like God raised Hitler to be an instrument in oppressing them and sending them to find the Jewish land God is fomenting all these anti anti-semitic uh, sentiments to push them back to their land they need to be there together they need to face the Antichrist, rebuild the temple, and be able to set up. There's a temple institute that is there, setting up the temple, and they have everything for it. It's just a question of when are we going to have to do it? And the anti-Semitism is even at the highest level. United Nations organization that is not looking at the transgressions of the Palestinians or Arab nations and looking at Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, and they are picking of them and calling them an apartheid nation and blacklisting them in a lot of ways. Look at Middle East, the gathering of forces. Russia is already there taking strong control. There's going to be, in the end time, alliance of Russia, Syria, and China, even uh, Turkey, and so on, against Israel. In the Bible, you don't have time to go through that. But you see those key players already positioning themselves for that period that it is going to happen. These signs are coming in. You see natural disasters, earthquakes on increase, flooding this one and the other one you see violence spiritism occultism rebellion all of them rising at a tremendous tempo many of the governments of the world shaking and so on these are signs of the things that will happen when jesus will come the second time but rapture will take place 
seven years before then. And if these things are unfolding before us, and we see moral decay, religious uh, um, ecumenism taking place, what do you do? You need to sit up. If you have not known Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you are hearing the voice, sound of my voice, what do you do? Run to Jesus. He's the only secure act. Get hold of him. You need to repent and give your life to Christ. Stop hardening yourself and going into the uh, theories and false teachings and so on. Look at the warning of the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 2. As many as here and they are still sitting on the fence and saying, no, I don't have conviction. I have this theory. I have the other one. What other thing do you need? And God is gathering his people, saving people. That's a tremendous way of revival going taking on now going on it will not continue forever god has a program he wants to gather people within this limited time and then the evacuation takes place you stay there forever why would you stay out there and not sure you are saved you need to get saved look at hebrews chapter 2 in hebrews chapter 2 verse Three, look at what he's asking you. If you are still there, you are not born again, you've not given your life to Christ, what number of messages will you hear? What other experience do you really need? You want to be a Pharisee? You want to be a scribe? Those that have hardened heart, conspiring to tempt Jesus. And Jesus said, why would that be? In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, how shall we escape? If what happens, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that had him. You are receiving the confirmation today. Stop sitting on the fence. Give your life, give your life to Christ. Live for him. And don't live a life that is just there for yourself, yourself. And you a believer, I need to address you a little bit. Yes, you've been a believer for how long? But you are now lingering in these last days, just like Lot did at his own time. Why would it be so? When you see all these things happening, what do you do? Put on your garment of zeal and righteousness and zealous work for God. Get out there and do what you can do before then. And many of us even started in the spirit. We are now descending into the flesh, carnality. You are asking, is it better, believer, can we get into this old habits and which one is allowable and which one is not allowable? Why would you even think of going back to your own former or consecration? No, there's a prescription for God for every one of us in this end time. Look at Luke's gospel chapter 21. Gospel according to Luke. And see what God is challenging us as believers to do in times like this. Luke chapter 21. Look at verse 28. Gospel according to Luke chapter 21. I am going to read verse 28. In verse 28 he says and when these things begin to come to pass, what will happen? Then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. God is telling every believer, brother, every sister, sister, every individual here, brother, sister, he's telling us as we see these things happening, look up. Look up. Let your heads be lifted up because your redemption that's coming from up is drawing nigh. Look up, not look unto man. Look up, look up, not into your business strategies that will distract you. Look up, into program of God for your life. Are you improving on your righteousness? Are you improving on your holiness lifestyle? Look up, not look down on challenges that are taking place in this world. Look up, look up, look up, not to your bank account, not to your possessions. You want to amass this and amass that? Garment of salvation is he spotted? Look up. The Lord say, He that expects him, look up. He will come in like manner. Look up, look up, not down, not into persecution that we are passing through, not into these domestic quarrels here and there. Look up, look up. Brethren, if you ever had gone through air travel, and many of us have, I will, I will presume all of us must have getting into airport, especially international departure lunges. When you step up, average airport departure lunch has what you call the departure uh, lunch flight details. They will have these boards that will arrange the flights. 
and you see them going one after the other going and you look you have your ticket and you know the uh, number of the aircraft you will see it and the time it will depart alongside the others anybody that comes in there will first go for that more, uh, board where it is displayed to identify my flight is it confirmed it's going to fly and then about 30 minutes before the time or one hour before depending on their schedule they will now tell you the departure gates where you are going to but between that time between the time of your coming and the time of departure your eye will be glued looking up to that flight departure schedule what are you looking up for my flight and the gates when i will go to you will make sure you'd never miss it because if you miss it that's the end it results in a cancellation you're not going to where you are going you will go back and start rebooking probably you might not travel that same day as it were and brethren let your spiritual cap be upon you look at the world we are not here for social club look at the way things are going and the lord is saying don't look with the physical eyes look up departure flight for heaven is about to be called up where will you be as an angel that will blow a trumpet what will you be doing at that time look at first john chapter 3 let's end with it in first john chapter 3 that's exactly reinforcing what we are telling ourselves today in first john chapter 3 i'm going to read verses 1 2 and 3 first john chapter 3 behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Don't allow the world to know you. Don't just want to mass yourself in the things of the world, that collate of the world, popularity of the world. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Everybody read the verse 3 with me, want to go. And every man that had this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. When you have that hope, you keep looking up in purity to him. Lord, it might be today, it might be tomorrow. Whatever time it is, let me not be caught on the other wrong side. Remember, twinkling of an eye, rapture has no duplicate. It takes place and that's it forever. The prayer is that you will enjoy and benefit from that glorious experience in Jesus' name. Rise up and go to God in prayers and call upon God this morning and tell God, Help me, O oh Lord. I am calling upon you. I am pleading with you, Lord. Strengthen me to make it at the rapture. Let your power be released upon me, O oh Lord. Yes, it's sounding so theoretical, but it's a real issue. It will happen soon and very soon. Jesus is coming back again. Unless you have believed in vain. Are you ready? Are you getting prepared? Are you ready to have him when he comes in his majesty and glory to take his saints home? A trumpet will sound one day where will you be it was so sound that the dead in christ will hear it was so sound sound that the dead will hear and then they will arise you that is alive will be caught up together with them open your mouth and call upon the lord and tell god spare me help me to escape the damnation help me to partake in this rapture oh lord make up your mind whom are you living for are you still on the other side not giving your life to jesus this is a moment you have to turn your life over to him this is a moment you have to repent of all unrighteousness and commit yourself into the hands of the lord and say god here am i here am i oh lord here am i oh lord i'm living for you look at all the signs we have told you about look at israelites that are gathering look at the economic distress of the world natural natural disasters that are taking place flood here fire here look at the covid 19 worldwide pandemic that has grounded the world it came in waves upon waves upon waves showing us that god knows he's in control he could even use it as a tool to bring this world to its knees look at what's building up in europe what is going up all over the world at this time what other sign can't you design the sign of the time do you want to be like israelites who will now say blessed is he 
that cometh in the name of the Lord when it is already too late. No, soon the church age will end. If you in the day of uh, civility, in day of calmness, in this period uh, that everything appears, you have freedom of worship and everything, and then before the river Jordan is swollen, you cannot, you, you are not doing anything, you cannot run with footmen, and now when river Jordan is swollen, is that when you will run? The Lord is saying, change your ways, change your ways, change your attitude, change your approach. Are you ready? Are you standing firm? Tell God, ask God for more grace. God, help me. Paul said, forgetting the past. I press on. I press on towards the mark of the highest calling. Oh, yes. I count everything but long done for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are you doing that? It's not time to beat your shoulders and say, I've achieved this. I have achieved that. No. This is a time of re sober reflection. Asking God, what remained for me to do? To do? What remained for me to do, O oh Lord? Lord, let me not be caught on our ways. Let me stand firm, O oh Lord. When the saints go marching in, Lord, I'll be part of the number. Your grace will be sufficient for me. Open your mouth and call upon the Lord. Open your mouth and plead with him. He will do it. He will rescue you. He will grant you his deliverance. You will be set free entirely today. Do it. Pray. Plead with the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we bless you for today. We worship and adore you for the revelation of your word. Especially the caution you sounded, O oh Lord, that we will be watchful to escape the damnation that is coming upon the world. Blessed be your name for the revelation of your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Father, we come from the attitude we believe the rapture. It's scriptural. And Lord, as you evacuate your saints and take them home, Father, because we believe we partake of that in Jesus' name. On the other end of the ladder, Father, we can't imagine what will happen upon humanity. And that's why we are pleading with you. A message like this and the challenge contained within it, let's walk with it at every point in time. Whether we are sleeping or awake, Father, let our spiritual ears be open, waiting for the trumpet to sound. And may we hear that trumpet when it sounds in Jesus' name at all the signs that are happening before us as we wake up every day. Lord, let's put on the garment of righteousness. Let's always check that we are in the right situation with you. And all the restitution we have to make, confessions we have to make, Lord, we will make them in Jesus' name. We bless you for having had us, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And so, Father, I bring your people before you as they get into this new week. We don't know when the Lord is coming. Whatever it is, I say commit them into your hands, that your hand will shepherd them. Everywhere they are going, may your presence go with them. All the needs of their life, supply unto them in Jesus' name. They step out here, the enemy is suggesting, no, this is the way you are going to go. They will not hear the enemy in Jesus' name. All the challenges in the homes of your people, domestic problems, financial challenges, take care of them in Jesus' name. On that glorious day, Lord, we don't know when it's going to happen. Every member of this district church, when the trumpet sounds, oh Lord, we will be qualified to be there and continue this fellowship hereafter in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.